how do you like the heat out there? Yeah. Yeah, just, just imagine yourself walking along a beach in Cancun or something, okay? That's what you got to think because then it feels kind of good. And uh, just remember that when it's, you know, five degrees below zero in the winter and you'll say, man, I long for those hot summer days again. So, uh, so enjoy what we have. It's a gift from God. We got all the green stuff growing, so hopefully that stays green all summer long. But it's, it's beautiful. The skies are blue. Mountains look beautiful. Just it's beautiful here in Colorado. And wherever you live online, I'm sure it's beautiful where you are too because God's made this world wonderful. Now, our kids tomorrow are going to see the beauty of this rocky, uh, what is it? Uh, what is it? Rocky Railroad. Rocky Railroad. I knew Rocky was in there somewhere, and I kept thinking I'm going to fight here. A Rocky Railroad. So tomorrow, kids are going to start VBS, Vacation Bible School. And we haven't done it for uh, two or three years. So kids are coming back. We're excited. They're excited. And I'm really excited about the theme because it's how Jesus pulls us through difficult times. And if we uh, have ever been in a place where we need to rem be reminded that Jesus gets us through, it's right now. So Jesus is getting through. And if you have things that you promised to bring to su for supplies, make sure you get them in today. And then if you've got kids you want to get registered, get them registered today. And if you can help, there's still some needs for volunteers. Uh, I think you'll just have fun being around the kids this week. So come and join us. Our staff's going to be participating as well. Also in your bulletin is something called Dad Fest. Dad Fest is this first ever thing we're going to do on Father's Day. We've got food trucks. We have old cars, we have games for parents and kids. It's going to take place on Sunday morning. So sometimes you wonder, what are we going to do for dad? Well, you know what? Dads love food trucks. Your dad loves. So we're going to have them here, and it's going to start at 11 o'clock after this service. So hang around, enjoy that, enjoy some fellowship in the parking lot, bring chairs. If you want a canopy, bring that umbrellas, whatever you need out there. But it's going to be a fun time just to hang out. And even if you just hang out for like a half hour, hour, we'd love to have you spend part of your day. This might be a good way to get dad to church too. If your dad or, or uh, your husband has a little trouble getting to church, say, hey, let's go to church and we're going to have uh, some treats afterwards. Also, I want to let you know that on the 16th of June, we have our next uh, family prayer night. So it's 6.30 p.m. Uh, we want to invite you to come and share as we come before the Lord again, um, seeking him, pouring out our needs before him. Today we're starting a brand new series uh, called Just Jesus. And, you know, this summer, a lot of us are going on vacations, making up for last year. So the things you didn't get to do, you're making sure you get done this summer. So people are going off to Disney World, they're going up to the mountains, they're seeing Grandma Grandpa, going all over the world to see beautiful things. My wife and I are going to see the Redwoods next month in California. Ever since I was a kid and sang that song, this land is your land, this land is my land from the Redwood Forest. I've wanted to see it. I want to see the big trees. So we get to, to do it um, this July. But this is a beautiful world that God has made. But I don't want you to miss what's most beautiful in this world, and it's Jesus. Because he's the one who made it. And he made it not to get our attention distracted from him, but to draw our attention to him. And so in the midst of all this, I want to urge you that this summer, make a special effort just to fall in love in a deeper way with Jesus Christ. He is the, the core of our being. Now, have you ever watched a movie and there's a scene or a statement made in a movie that kind of just causes you to like shake your head and go, oh my goodness, that changes everything about the story that I've seen up to this point. I mean, when, when we watched The Sixth Sense back in the late 90s, and the ring falls off, uh, Bruce Willis, he's Malcolm, his wife's finger falls off on the floor, and you go, whoa, whoa what just happened here? And, and in his own mind, he's starting to replay things. They take you back, look into all these past scenes, and you look through a different lens. And uh, some of you might remember in Star Wars, there's this great duel in Empire Strikes Back with Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. And, and Luke's getting pushed back, and he's really angry at Darth Vader because he knows that Darth Vader killed his father. And then Darth Vader says, no, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> and so, and he goes, no, you know, changes the whole, you go, oh my goodness. Do you know that even the actors did not know that? They did not know that line in there. Mark Hamill didn't know until right before they shot the scene. It was like this top secret thing because this is going to, Blow it open for everybody. Like, oh my goodness, Darth is Luke's dad. And it changes the story. Well, there's a moment in the Bible where, where something happens and people go, oh, really? That changes everything. And it happened in Luke chapter 24. So what happened is Jesus was crucified, buried, and there's a rumor going around that he's risen from the dead. And the disciples hear it 
And they see that he's gone, but it's like, did it really happen? Because we're just not sure. And so Jesus um, comes along these two guys that are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's a seven-mile walk. And they're walking along the road, and they're replaying the events that have just occurred back in Jerusalem for the past few days. And Jesus eavesdrops, and he comes in and says, hey, guys, what you talking about? He goes, you haven't heard? He goes, no, what's going on? Now, Jesus is playing, just playing them up. He goes, oh, man, you know, there's this guy, Jesus, and we thought he was going to be the king, the Messiah, really believed it. He was, did miracles, did all these things. And then he got crucified. And talk of the town is now he's risen from the dead. And then listen to what Luke says in his gospel. He says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's like, guys, didn't your Bible tell you about these things? All the things that, that you're just talking about, shouldn't you have known them already? And then he goes into Jerusalem. He comes to a meeting where the disciples are all gathered together, and they're in the, kind of the same mindset. And Jesus says something very similar to them. Again, Luke. This is not Luke Skywalker, but Luke the doctor in the Bible. It says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. It was like, Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's, oh, oh, that, it all, it all makes sense now. And so when they go into the book of Acts and forward, it's like they are preaching with confidence. They are bold because they get it now. Now, when Jesus says, this is what written, was written about in, in the law of Moses, that's the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. That's that category. He says, um, the prophets, that's all the prophetic writings of the Old Testament, prophets, and, and then, then the other writings are the words like Psalms and Job and those books. The three major categories of Scripture, uh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, which was the prophets, and the writings are called the Ketuvim, and the T-N-K, and you put in a couple vowels, makes the word Tanakh. And so for the Jewish person, they didn't have Old Testament, they had the Tanakh, which was those three major sections of the Old Testament. And what Jesus is saying is every single one of those sections, guess what, is about me. This book is about me. In fact, we know the New Testament is about Jesus, but if you just look at this whole book, the Old Testament prepares us for his coming, the Gospels present his life and ministry, Acts proclaims his gospel message, the letters promote life with Jesus, and Revelation promises his return. From the beginning to the end, there's one central character, and his name is Jesus. It's all about him. You know, it's one of the most amazing testimonies about this book is there are more than 35 different writers that wrote in three different languages on different continents in some parts over 1,500 years with no human editor telling people what they should write. And yet when all these books were put together, they, they weave together this fabric that tells one major story from beginning to end. It's as if... There's some supernatural being who's actually editing this book and making sure that what needs to be put in here is being written by these different people at different times in different places. And that's him. That's God. That's why this book is called God's Word because he's the ultimate author, orchestrator of it. But he used human writers actually to pen the book. It's an incredible testament. Think of this. Just take people all across the world writing about a theme and just then try to put them together and see if it works. But the Bible is amazing. And what I want to do today, and this is going to sound a little bit academic today, because we're going to, I just want to bombard you with some stuff of how the Old Testament reveals Jesus. You know how the New Testament does. You may not know how the Old Testament does. What, what was Jesus possibly showing these people that the Old Testament was saying about himself? There's a lot of things. So I'm going to share with you seven of those things today. Number one, that he is the serpent crusher. He's a serpent crusher. Adam and Eve are, are put in this garden, and their goal is to populate the earth and manage it, manage the, the gardens and everything, just manage the earth. Along comes a serpent. He, he persuades them to break God's command. It's one commandment. It's one restriction. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what do they do? They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their consequences. So the consequences are they now get moved out of the garden Man is told that he's going to have to work the ground because it's going to be weedy, it's going to be difficult, he's going to sweat doing it. The woman is going to have pain in childbirth. 
And then he speaks to the serpent and says to the serpent these words, I will put enmity between you and, your, and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right there, this is actually called the proto Evangelium, which means, in theological terms, the first gospel. Because right there at the beginning, we learn that God is sending someone that's not a man, someone greater, who's actually going to do this spiritual battle against an evil enemy called Satan, the serpent. And he's going to defeat him. Now, what he portrays in here is that the offspring, which, which are looked at maybe the demonic minions under Satan's rule, they're going to affect this, this, this offspring of the woman. And we look at the crucifixion of Jesus and see how Satan may have think he won a victory. Satan, Satan thought he, he stopped God's plan when he put Jesus on the cross. But it was as if he only bruised his heel. It wasn't a fatal blow. But in rising from the dead, Jesus turned the tables on the devil and began to deal a crushing blow to him. And so not only did he disarm the powers at the cross, but all through the age of the church, he says, the church is advancing, the gates of hell can't stop it. And there's coming a time at the end when Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire forever. So, so that's, that's a spiritual battle taking place. And this one that would come from the line of the woman would defeat the serpent, which we know from Scripture is Satan. The Amplified Bible writes that verse this way. The serpent shall only bruise his heel while the Redeemer shall fatally bruise your head. Some of your Bibles actually say crush his head. I love this verse in the book of Romans that says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I mean, it sounds really like, oh, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Under your feet. Your feet. Why? You're the body of Christ. How is Jesus crushing the serpent through his body, which becomes his agent on earth to crush Satan? Never think that Satan has one up on you. Just put your foot on him. You have authority over serpents and scorpions, Scripture says. You have authority because of who you belong to if you belong to Jesus Christ. So, so he wins this great spiritual battle. It's already talked about at the very beginning of Scripture. Secondly, he's the seed of Abraham. God's plan to create this population of people that would reflect his image kind of fell apart with Adam and Eve. You know, just look at their kids. They went AWOL. And then it comes to a place where God says, you know what, we're just going to start from scratch again. So he brings a flood, starts over with Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. And guess what? Same thing happens. They go off and fall into sin. And so, so God says, you know, I, I'm going to do it my way. He picks a man named Abraham. And Abraham is well up in years. He's beyond childbearing years, both he and his wife, because God wants it to be known that this is going to be a miracle. This will only happen if I cause it to happen. So, so he caused, he's, he's promising to Abraham that, that, that he's going to work out his plan through him. And in Genesis 22, when he reiterates the plan, he says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The King James Version actually says, and in your seed. Now, that word is used a lot in the Old Testament in older versions, the seed. And you know why? Why, is that, why, are, why are offspring called seed? Because it was believed in biblical times, because they didn't have the scientific knowledge we have, that a man has the seed of children and plants them inside of the womb of the woman who then carries the child to term. So, so we know that that sperm, the seed of the sperm, actually unites with an egg, and, and, and the male and female both contribute majorly to this process. But the belief then, because they didn't know science, said, well, this is how, this is the story, kind of, kind of the birds, of the be birds, birds and the bees. This is how it works. By the way, think about that, the, the birds and the bees. I was, my parents never told me anything about the birds and bees, and I was trying to think myself, we never told our kids about the birds and the bees. I don't even know what you tell people about the birds. What, <laughs> what do you tell people about the birds? I don't even know what you tell them. And then bees, well, they're pollinating plants, but what about other bees? How do they make baby bees? I don't know. I, I, I don't know where that came from or what that has to do with anything, but I do know this. You live on a farm, you learn it. Be around animals. In fact, our, um, 
our daughter lives in Arizona, and they've got a little construction project going on in their house. So they were busy, and they left the house and left their, their two dogs. Now, they've got a mixed breed dog that's probably about 40, 50 pounds, and then they have a little shih tzu that's only, I don't know, a year, year and a half old, little tiny thing. And one day, the kids, they come in, and they start screaming. They say, Mom, the dogs are stuck together. And so mom has to do a real quick, uh, you know, birds and bees lesson of what's going on here. And uh, it was pretty traumatic. I mean, talk about, talk about discouraging your kids. You know, that's a good way. Just let them, let them be around the animals and this. okay, not me, not doing that. So, so God, God's raising up this generation through Abraham. Now, Paul in the New Testament um, explains this because Abraham has no clue who this offspring will be or what they'll do. But Paul says, I know who it is. He writes in Galatians. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say unto your offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. So way back then, the gospel is being preached to Abraham, saying that one is coming, and this is referring to Jesus. But he doesn't know that, but Paul knows it. This one person will be the blessing to all the nations. All the nations now can return to God through Jesus Christ. He's the seed of Abraham. He's the Lamb of God. This is a theme that began with the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law said that it had all these commandments that people would look at and go, done it, done it, ooh, didn't do that, mm, didn't do so good on that one, ooh, that's, that's real bad too, and would go through the commandments and realize how sinful they were. If you just look through the Ten Commandments, you'll see for yourself how many you've kept, how many you haven't. And so people would realize, I'm not, I'm not worthy. So what do I do about it? And God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have animals shed their blood in your place because you've thumbed your nose at me, you've rebelled against me, you rejected me. I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to roll that punishment onto the animals. They will give their lives, shed their blood for you. Now, I shared with you last week that the blood contains life. Now, if you didn't hear, you might want to listen to this part. The blood in, in biblical times represented life. And so when they, when they sprinkled blood on things, which sounds kind of gross to us, it was like covering it with life. And so animals gave their life so that we could be covered. Our darkness could be covered with life and we could be in God's presence without being judged. This Old Testament practice went on day after day, constantly smoke rose from the, from the, the either tabernacle or temple because animals were being slain as a constant reminder, man, we're bad people. There's always something burning over there uh, because we've sinned. So when John the Baptist is baptizing people, he sees Jesus coming, and then listen to what he says. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. He says, Jesus, see, that's, that's the Lamb of God. What do you think was going through people's mind when John the Baptist said that? He's going to get killed because that's what happens to the lambs. This one is going to be the one that really will pay for our sin. John the Baptist knows it. This theme of lamb in the Old Testament carries into the ministry of Jesus up into the Passover when what happens on the Passover? The lamb gets slain. What happened to Jesus during the week of Passover? The lamb got slain. And so the New Testament writers write about it. Peter writes about the precious blood of the lamb. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed in Revelation. Guess who's, guess who's seated on the throne? The lamb. The lamb. The lamb is all through Scripture because the lamb represents who? Jesus Christ. It's this imagery that God has been giving so that we would understand who he is, what he's done for us. Then we see this character called the angel of the Lord. Angels are spiritual beings. They're not human. They're different, though sometimes they may look like humans. In fact, angels will appear at places, and sometimes they look very much like humans. In fact, we are told to uh, be kind to strangers because unbeknownst to us, we might be entertaining angels. So God, at times... I don't know how it works, but God gives angels physical bodies at times, physical clothes. I mean, think about it. Where do angels get their clothes? Well, the same God that gave them a body probably gave them the clothes too. So the angels show up at these various times in the Bible, a lot of stories of angels, and they look like people. They look like people because they're carrying out God's assignment. That's what the word angel means. It means messenger. 
Now, there are different levels of messengers, angelic messengers. There are the normal kind, and then there are like archangels, which are ruling angels. You have Gabriel. Who else do you know of? Michael. And there's that one that went rogue, Lucifer. But there's another angel that we know just by title, not by name. He is called the angel of the Lord. He is, he's never called an angel of the Lord. He's called the angel of the Lord. Kind of like the Ohio State Buckeyes. The, there's one. There's only one. The angel of the Lord. And he shows up, and he shows up in a number of places. These are believed to be theophanies or Christophanies. These are appearances of God in a physical form. Now, this is amazing. This is kind of mind-blowing. That God would actually take on a body to reveal himself to people. Get ready. God's preparing people for when that's really going to happen through Jesus. But, but he does it through these visitations. They are what I would call cameo appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. Some of you grew up watching uh, movies by a guy named Alfred Hitchcock. Any of you watch Alfred Hitchcock? Do you know that Alfred Hitchcock appears in most of his movies? He makes these little cameo appearances. He, he said that people began to watch the movie to see where he shows up, that, that he got discouraged because he says, I want you to watch the movie, not look for me. So he would make those appearances at the beginning of the movie to get it out of the way. But, to, but in uh, the Marvel series... Over 60 of the marbles, guess who's in that? Stan Lee, the, the creator of the Marvel's universe. He, he appears in these little cameo roles in every single one of those episodes. Think about this. The creator of this universe shows up in these cameo appearances. Now, I want to point out one of them. It happens to a gal named Hagar in the Old Testament. Hagar is a maidservant of Abraham and Sarah. And when Sarah is struggling to get pregnant, she's, she's an elderly woman She's told she's going to have a baby, but it's not happening. So she says to Abraham, hey, I want you to, maybe you should just have the baby with Hagar. Maybe that's what God wants. So he lies with Hagar, she gets pregnant, and then Sarah gets jealous. And, she, and uh, she's pretty rude to Hagar, so Hagar just leaves discouraged. And she goes out into the wilderness and just sits down. And the, and the angel, the angel of the Lord comes to her. Listen to what the angel says. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Now listen to this. I will do this. I will multiply your offspring. The angel isn't saying God will multiply your offspring. He's saying I'll do that. The angel of the Lord is saying I will do that. Only God creates. Angels don't. This is God speaking to her of what he's going to do. God visited her the form of this angelic figure. It's believed to be very possibly Jesus Christ. Another example, one you're probably more familiar with, is when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Uh, they got thrown into this fiery furnace, but it was so hot that the guys that threw them into the furnace burnt to death doing that. But the other three guys end up in the fire and they start walking around like they're in a sauna. You know, you know they're, they're drinking their tea, and they're going, hey, it's kind of warm in here, but it's comfortable. I kind of like it. You know, it's, nothing is singed. Not a hair on their, on their arms, nothing on their clothing gets singed. It's just amazing. And Nebuchadnezzar looks at them and goes, oh, my goodness, what's happening here? And here's what it says in Daniel. Now, this is an unbeliever, someone that doesn't believe in our God. Notice this. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king, he answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. There is something different about the fourth one. There's something almost majestic, godlike about him. Who's that with him? It's Jesus. Could this be? When the Lord says, I'll walk with you through the fire, I'll be with you in the storm, is this Jesus saying, I want you to know I am with you? And he's, he's appearing in this glimpse in the story in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. Another image is called, he is the perfect tabernacle. Gary Smalley, who used to be a great teacher on family and marriage, uh, once said that the, the best family bonding experience you can ever have is camping. And I, I wholeheartedly disagree. I think it can lead to divorce. It can lead to unresolved tensions. I mean, it just can be awful. I mean, sitting, laying in a confined sleeping bag on a hard surface just isn't my thing. 
Uh, you know, I feel claustrophobic in the tent. I remember one time we traveled up to the uh, Yellowstone National Forest and we stopped on the way late at night at the Grand Tetons National Forest. We had a, a KOA campground spot held and we had uh, borrowed a tent, four-person tent from my sister. So it's late at night, it's dark, everyone's in their tents but us. And we pull up in our Bronco, we start unloading things and it's drizzling. So I, I have my son Tyler come out and we're going to put up the tent. So we lay out the fabric on the ground, put the tarp down and put the tent down, spread it out. I said, hand me the, where, where the, where the, uh, the poles, you know, the poles that you put together and bend to get the arch. He goes, well, they're not out here. We go back in the Bronco. They're not there. I call my sister, who we borrowed it from. She goes, oh, they're here in the garage. I said, that's, a, that's real good right now because we're... 9.30 at night, it's dark, it's drizzling, and we have no place to sleep at this campground site. So anyway, we went into town, bought a motorhome, brought it out. No, we didn't. We actually went to Kmart, <coughs> got a tent, and put it up. Uh, but but I, I understand why so many of you have motorhomes. Now, that's the way to travel. That's the way to camp, right? That's the way to camp. But in the Old Testament, there's a tent, and it's called the tabernacle. And God tells Moses when they leave Egypt, I want you to build this, this structure this tabernacle, and that's where I'll meet with you guys. Because you're not worthy to come up on the mountain and meet with me, but I'll come down, and at times, I'll meet you with you right down here. So he gave, he gave detailed instructions, like a, a, a manual, how it should be built, the dimensions of it, the fabrics of it, all of it. It's all laid out in Scripture. It's right there in the first books of the Bible. Lays it out, they build this thing. Now, it's not real fancy and glorious, but it's visible. That's the key. It's a visible place where God meets with them. And we are, we are creatures that like to experience things. We like to see things. We like to touch things. You like to have a place called home, right? None of us want to live in a tent, like a temporary structure that gets up, taken up and down. We, li- we like a home because there's something about the comfort of always knowing you can go back and settle in that place. And there's going to come a time later where, where even the Jewish people say, hey, let's get done with this tent stuff and build a temple. But right now, it's just, it's just a tent because it's a temporary structure. But here's the beauty of this tent. They can take it all down, fold it up, take the poles out, and move along because God wants the Israelites to know, I am going with you. We're doing this together. I'm going to walk with you all the way to the promised land, okay? So this is, this is my home. And every, when they would camp in places, right in the middle of the camp set, site would be the tabernacle, and all the tribes would put their tents around that one. It was right in the middle of it, signifying I'm right here in the middle of everything. Don't forget that. I'm with you. And so this is called a type. A type is a, a thing, a person, or a practice that illustrates something greater about Jesus or his redemptive work. It's like a picture. So God is preparing them mentally for this picture of the invisible God is dwelling in a physical, physical visible tent. You know, in the New Testament, your body is called a tent. Paul says that this tent is like a temporary, humble tent that's going to just fall apart one day. But this tent contains something beautiful. It contains your spirit. It's inside this tent. So when when Jesus came in the New Testament, this thing called the incarnation, it was God taking on a new tent, not a fabric, but a flesh. And so John, in his gospel, the very first chapter of his gospel says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt in some of your Bibles is translated tabernacled. It means he pitched his tent among us. God pitched his tent in the body of Jesus Christ saying, remember that old thing where I used to dwell in that tent? Replaced it. I'm now dwelling in this guy, in this body. In fact, the New Testament says the fullness of God dwells in the body of Christ. He dwells. So Jesus became very visible. Now, just like the tent in the Old Testament, the Old Testament says there was nothing fancy about this tent, this body of Jesus. It was pretty normal looking, pretty plain. It wasn't like Jesus was spectacular bodily form. But people looked at him and said, you know, he's just kind of normal. He's just like everybody else. But here was the beautiful thing. Jesus in a body could go wherever the people were. He could move around. Once again, God's tabernacle was mobile. And when Jesus went to heaven, he said, I'm going to form a new tabernacle. And you know what it is? His church, which is indwelt by his Holy Spirit. 
So, so Jesus is the fulfillment of the tabernacle. In the book of Hebrews, it explains that when, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, it actually, it actually says in the Gospels that this temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, this curtain that was like three to four inches thick, like superhuman hands, took the curtain, ripped it open, and it, it, it was the curtain that separated the common people from the holy of holies. And once that was opened, it was very symbolic that God's presence was now accessible to everybody. But listen to how Hebrews portrays that rendering, rending of the temple. <clears throat> Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. Jesus' body being broken for us was, was representative of the fact that God is now accessible to, to us. He's the greater tabernacle. He's also the suffering servant. There are all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus, about where he would be born. He'd be born in Bethlehem. Um, it, it, there's prophecies about where he would spend some of his childhood, in Egypt. There's prophecies about his ministry and, and what he would do. There's prophecies about how he would die, how he'd be betrayed for pieces of silver. Um, all these prophecies were spoken of Jesus. Now, some of them were very uh, mysterious. Like, you wouldn't know them until someone told you. Like, oh, that was about Jesus. You go, oh, yeah, that, I can see how that relates to Jesus. But they wouldn't have known that back then. There are other ones, though, that are very clear. That this is, watch this. When you see this happen, you know who it's talking about. So there's a story of the suffering servant in, um, in uh, Isaiah 52 and 53. And this person is coming, representing God, but he's not going to come in power. He's not going to be like this king with authority. He's going, to, he's going to be mistreated, and he's actually going to die. And the Jews are struggling, saying, well, this doesn't sound like the Messiah because the Messiah is this powerful, exalted figure. This sounds like somebody else. Now listen to this. And again, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus came. How beautiful it describes what happened to Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, when they read that back then, they go, what's that all about? But when you saw Jesus on the cross, you had to say, oh, my goodness, how accurate that was. Crucifixion didn't even exist when this was written. But God knew how he would die. Now, I wanted to share this particular passage with you because... In the early church, they only had the Old Testament. For 300 years, the church only had the Old Testament. Can you imagine coming to church and that's all we're preaching from is the Old Testament? Maybe we got a letter from Paul that we could read or a letter from someone else. But pretty much they only had the Old Testament to go with. You think, how did they do that? How did you lead people to Jesus with just the Old Testament? Remember what Jesus said, this whole book's about me. So one day, a guy goes to Jerusalem. He's on a mission from a queen of Ethiopia why he's there, he probably hears, hears some stories about Jesus. So on the way back to um, northern Africa, he's riding in his chariot, and he's reading a scroll of this very passage from Isaiah. Now, he's got to be pretty determined because I know what it's like to read in the passenger seat of a car, and I don't like it. I don't like to read in a car because it's kind of hard to get con con you know, concentrate when you're bouncing around. Can you imagine in a chariot, <laughs> trying to read something in a chariot like this? You know, I don't know how he's doing it. But he's going along in the chariot, he's reading it, and Philip comes along. And uh, the, 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 the Holy Spirit tells Philip, go talk to that guy. Philip comes over and says, hey, what, what are we reading today? He goes, well, I'm actually reading this passage where Isaiah writes about this person, but I don't know who he's talking about. I don't know if he's talking about himself or is he talking about someone else. Can you help explain that to me? And right then and there, it says, Philip shared with him the good news about Jesus Christ. And it clicked. And this guy sees some water over to the side and says, hey, can't I be baptized too? And he goes down in the water and Philip baptizes him. 
Do you know, think about this. You can lead people to Christ with just the Old Testament. Just the Old Testament. Because that's what they did in the early church for 300 years. It spoke of Jesus. And the last thing I want to point out is that Jesus is the better prophet, priest, and king. There are three primary offices in the Old Testament. The prophet is who God spoke through. The priest is who God did redemptive work through. They, did, they were the intercessors for the people. And then um, the king was the, the one who administered justice and, and really protected the people, led them into battle. That was God's representative as well. So you got prophet, priest, and king. You have some great ones. For example, Moses was a great prophet. But even Moses knew that there was a greater prophet coming. Way back in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy and the scriptures in your bulletin, Moses tells the people, hey, I don't know the guy's name, but there's coming a day when there's going to be a prophet that's greater than me, and you better listen to him. And so in the New Testament, there's a time where Peter is preaching. He just performed a miracle of healing, and he's preaching to the crowd. He brings that very passage up. It's found in Acts 3. He quotes Moses. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, and you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. I mean, this is like life and death. You better, when this prophet comes, you better listen to him. Your life depends on it. So then, then Peter says this, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. He's telling them about Jesus. Remember that guy that Moses was telling you about, that when he comes, you better listen to him? It's Jesus. So listen to him. He's telling you to turn from where you're going because you're headed to destruction. Turn around. He's, he's the superior prophet. He's also the superior priest. Aaron and, and all the Levitical priests would offer sacrifices, and they'd have to do it again the next day and the next day, and the bigger sacrifices once a year, they do it every year, year after year after year. I mean, their work was never done. You were always employed if you were a priest. But then Jesus comes along and it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Like, job done. The rest of you priests, you're fired. We're done. It's over. No more sacrifices. What? Yeah, no more sacrifices. This was the last one. It's over. The perfect priest. And he's the greater king. I think the greatest king in the Old Testament, without a doubt, is David. Even though David was flawed, David was a man after God's own heart. And yet even David was told that a better king was coming. Pro the prophet Nathan, who worked alongside David, was told by the Lord, you go tell David this. Tell David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you and you shall who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who is that? Who is this person from the line of David? Well, the very first book of the New Testament, in the very first verses of the New Testament, Matthew lays out the genealogy of Jesus. And to introduce that genealogy, Matthew says that, that Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the seed, the offspring of Abraham, the offspring of David, all converge in one person, Jesus Christ. And Jesus knows it. He, he knows he's that king because his message when he first starts preaching is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He knows why he's come. He's come to be a king. And his kingdom began on, on earth. It began in a spiritual form. Uh, people look and go, where is it? And Jesus said, you know, it's, it's not fully here yet, but there's coming a day when the king will return and it'll be very visible. And all the nations of the earth will be placed under his feet and he will reign he is king of kings and lord of lords. And Revelation speaks well of that. I, I could go on. Just there's so many things in the Old Testament. You could look at the stories, the people. Joseph is like a, a picture of Jesus. He's betrayed for pieces of coins, you know, for coins. He's sold into bondage. God elevates him up to the place of second in power in Egypt. Wow, that's kind of like Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Um, Jonah goes into the belly of a big fish for three days. And what does Jesus say about that? Hey, you remember that story of Jonah? I'm going to be in the belly of the earth for three days, and I'll come again. You look at um, Noah and how Noah built this ark to save people from the judgment of God. Jesus says, get, in, get, get close to me. I'm like the ark. 
If you get close to me, if you kind of get in Christ, it will save you from the judgment that is to come. There's these pictures after pictures all through the scripture of, of Jesus given to draw our attention to him. But my point in all this was just to kind of overwhelm you in a way to say, from beginning to end, this book is about one person, Jesus. And if, if the message of the Bible is Jesus, don't you think he should be the theme of your life? Don't you think he should be the most important part of our life? Don't you think God's trying to tell us that your life doesn't make sense apart from Jesus? You were made by him, you were made for him. He's not just someone out here that he's nice to know about. He's, he's a historical figure who lived. He's, he's someone that's kind of fun to learn about, but go on with your own life. He says, no, no, you, your life really doesn't make sense apart from him. But I'll tell you, like those, those guys on the road to Emmaus who had that aha moment, when, when I gave my life to Christ, all of a sudden, it was like, oh, I get it now. That's how things fit together. That's what's happening in the world. That's how, how this should be. This is, this is what makes the most sense. It doesn't mean that all my questions are answered. It's just like, man, I see the picture so much more clearly now that Jesus is at the heart of my life. There's so many things in your life regarding Christianity that you'll never figure out, like, I can't answer that question. I can't figure this out. And I don't understand the Holy Spirit perfectly. And I don't understand, you know, the end times. I don't understand all these things, maybe the best as I should. And you know what? Those are things worth studying. But there's one thing you really need to know more than anything else, and that is who Jesus is and who is he to you. In fact, I would say that's the most important thing about you, what you believe about Jesus and who he is to you, because eternity is at stake. Jesus isn't just a part of life. He's just not one of the priorities in life. I always liken it to a wheel. He's not a spoke alongside work, family, vacation, finances, and then there's Jesus, no, no, Jesus is the hub of the wheel. And everything else takes its meaning from that. And when Jesus is in his rightful place at the center of your life, all of a sudden your life comes in the right balance. I love the fact that the Apostle Paul, you know, a very smart man, said, you know what, I resolve to know nothing among you except this, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I, that's, that's all I really know well is Jesus. And the older I get, the, the more I long to know Jesus better. I mean, think about it. You're going to spend forever with him, right? At least, isn't it your desire to spend forever? Why, why don't we want to just start getting, him, getting to know him as best we can right here so when we see each other, we'll be like, hey, I, I thought about you every day. I, I worshiped you. I prayed to you. I thanked you, and now I get to do it in person. So this summer, I just want to urge you, Keep Jesus right at the forefront. He's, he's the primary message of Scripture, making the theme of your life. Live in such a way that your life doesn't make sense apart from Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and if you're at home, you can even stand with us as well if you're online. Because I want to say a prayer, and I'm going to ask you to join me in praying. You can kind of either echo it or say it in your own words in your heart, but if you decide to pray along with me and some of you may not want to pray this, and that's fine. But for those who do, those who are hungering for a greater connection to Jesus, would you pray with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for all the effort you have gone through to make yourself known. And I look at my life and think of all the ways you've tried to reveal yourself to me through circumstances and through people and through teachings. And I can't run from you, and I don't want to run from you. I don't want to hide from you. I don't want to ignore you. I want to come running to you. I want to embrace you. I want to know you more. I want to echo the words of Paul in Philippians 3. I want to know you more in the power of your resurrection. Everything else is rubbish by comparison. So Jesus, forgive me for neglecting you. Forgive me for making you one of many priorities. May you be the overwhelming priority of my life. May you be the thing I cling to more than anything else. May you, may you cause my soul to ache when I don't think about you. Make my heart long for you when I don't talk to you. Humble me in your presence. Allow me to see your greatness in the beauty around me, in the words of Scripture, in the people. Let me, let me see you like never before. May, may my eyes be open so that I understand all the ways 
you have, you're trying to make yourself known to me. I love you. I want to serve you. I want to know you more. In Jesus' name. If you agree, would you say amen? Amen. 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 I'm going to invite our prayer partners to be available up front here. I just want to apologize for just felt like a lot of stuff to pour on you, but the overwhelming thing is just, I am just blown away by how much Jesus is there. Our prayer partners, if you'd be up front here and if you need prayer, they'd love to pray with you. Maybe you're going through a difficult time in your life. Maybe, maybe there's something heavy on your heart as you came in today. We'd love to pray for you and with you. So come on up as we pray. The rest of you, God bless you. Uh, we'll see you this week.